Well, thank you for the invitation. I, I thought it was kind of odd to get an invitation to do one on exploration geophysics, and I, I don't usually consider myself an exploration geophysicist. However, I have a lot of students from Africa, and many of them are very interested in exploration. So I'd like to just acknowledge my uh, co-authors there. Um, and a key, I guess, architect of this work is Andrew Kachmwehe, who's a, a student of mine from Uganda, and he's, he used to work for the Ugandan Geological Survey. So um, there's been a lot of, I guess, the resurgence of exploration work going on in Africa. And in many of these countries, the uh, economic growth is going to be, is probably, probably going to take place through uh, mineral exploration that will help to provide reduction in uh, poverty. And in many of these cases, of course, we're getting new finds in oil and gas and minerals every day in, in Africa. So mining really presents a great opportunity for many of these African countries to get themselves out of poverty. But in addition to that, uh, it also provides uh, potential for capacity, capacity building skills development, you know, technology transfer, as well as uh, sustainable development. I don't know if many of you are familiar with this, but in March uh, 2014, the World Bank announced what is called the Billion Dollar Map for Africa. And essentially, the motivation was the fact that over the last 20 years or so, many African countries have lost more than $1.4 trillion uh, because of lack of understanding what they have. And so they sign um, less than adequate mining uh, contracts with a lot of mining companies or investors and simply because they don't know what they have. So knowledge is in fact power. And so that was really the motivation for the World Bank to initiate this new project. And I think my understanding is that the project was supposed to be launched in um, July. And it's going to have a, a big component of that, of course, is airborne geophysical surveys. Uh, which will be followed up with ground geologic mapping, and the whole idea is to be able to have an inventory of what's available for the different countries. So for example, I think the World Bank stated that Zambia, we know is one of the top copper producing countries in the world, and yet it's not really been able to, uh, it doesn't have a good inventory of where all its copper deposits are. And so that's the whole idea is to have an inventory through this high resolution airborne geophysical mapping project uh, to provide the countries with an inventory of where their mineral resources are, are so that they can have a better understanding as well as perhaps so, so that they can sign better contracts. In the end, um, the World Bank hopes to be able to have a geodatabase and which would encourage and facilitate you know, foreign investors. For me, I think the data set as a scientist becomes a wealth of information and we have been able to tap into this uh, high resolution data sets um, in Africa, especially in Botswana and, um, and Uganda where we've been working and also Malawi has just completed their survey and we have some ongoing projects in Malawi. I do a lot of tectonic work and so these data sets are really providing an unprecedented view of um, the basement geology of Africa which would help for our understanding of the tectonic evolution. And I just put this map up, and this is a, the, one of the, this is a, the airborne uh, magnetic map of uh, Uganda. And here we've been using it not only for mineral exploration, but more for understanding the tectonic development of the western arm of the uh, East African reef system. So here, for example, you can clearly see, and this is the first vertical derivative map, and you can clearly see the outline of the Aberton Graben, which is one of the rift basins. And here we see how uh, the Aberton Graben is propagating north, north eastwards, but meets this uh, block of Precambrian basement where there are no preferred um, structural orientations, and therefore the rift then jumps through this transfer zone into what is now what is known as the rhino graben. Both the rhino graben and the Aberton graben have been big resource place for in terms of oil and gas. In fact, um, in, I think it was 2006 or so, or maybe even earlier, that we the the I think it was Tolo Oil discovered huge what two or three billion barrels of oil reserves in Uganda, and that has spurred a lot of activity along almost all the reef basins in East Africa. 
So we can clearly see that we are using these more for tectonic studies and we, we were able to show, to demonstrate that the, the rift is strongly controlled by pre-existing structures and when it reaches this block here with no preferred orientation, it transfers into the rhino graben. And we also, in fact, we had a poster here on Tuesday demonstrating the Aswa shear zone, which is a major tectonic feature in this part of Africa. It's known to bifurcate the East African Reef system into the Western and the Eastern branch. Uh, most maps to date show it as just a nice one linear feature, but from these maps we are able to demonstrate that the Aswa shear zone in fact is uh, almost 50 kilometers wide zone of ductile uh, deformation, a uh, strike slip motion, and, uh, and so we can clearly see how these new data sets are really revealing what the true structure of um, the Aswa shear zone. So those are some of the things that I think that I'm really looking forward to this billion dollar map because it is really going to provide um, us with some excellent scientific database that we can use to understand, to uh, enhance our understanding of you know, the tectonic evolution of the continents. So um, Uganda then in, I think it was 2007 or 8 that they completed their survey and they've acquired more than 3.6 million line kilometers of high resolution and they did um, mag and radiometrics and in focus areas they did high, uh, high resolution EM as well. And this was for them a first stage of mineral exploration even though as soon as they finished this then they found the oil and then everybody went to the oil and basically it's not really been used a lot for the mining potential but there is that, you know, there is that uh, pot potential there to have. And this is just a radiometric map, and you can clearly see again the Aswa shear zone right here, uh, really, really nicely um, expressed in these maps. So I'm going to be talking to you today about the single granite, which is right here. It's a small granitic body right next to a larger one, which is called the Mubende granites, and we'll tell, tell you a little bit about how, what we're able to do here. So the single granite is part of the Mubende single suite and covers an area of about 700 uh, square kilometers. It occurs within a mining, a gold mining district, which is known as the Mubende Gold District, that has copper, nickel, cobalt, lead, uh, tungsten, columbite, and tantalite. And it is suggested to have been emplaced within metapellites of the Buganda group, and it is part of the Rowenzori Four belt and is dated at close to about 1.4 uh, billion years. So this just shows you these, these two uh, sweets here, Batholithia, the Mubende, and the single granite. While the Mubende granite has a very good surface expression, uh, the single granite is not very well expressed. And however, the new data sets that are coming out, you can clearly see that it has a very, very nice radiometric signature as well as a very pronounced um, magnetic, um, uh, magnetic signature. So previous studies suggest that the single granite in fact has um, it's, it's, it's mostly a pink uh, porphyritic granite in, its, in the middle part of it and a very fine gra green granite in the, outer, in, in the outer parts of it. So our objective here was to try to investigate the relationship between uh, the intrusive centers of the uh, single granite to provide insights as to how the granitic body was emplaced and examine the links between uh, mineralization, uh, the distribution of minerals, as well as the structure of the granite itself, and also to refine the geologic map of this part of uh, Uganda. So the surveys uh, parameters, in fact, this survey was, um, I think it was done, completed by Fugro, and the survey parameters included 80 to 100 meters terrain clearance. The line spacings were 200 to 500 meters with tie lines of about uh, two, two kilometers. So what we have done then is to use the raw, the total magnetic field map itself and then perform a lot of filters to it and we use, we usually use um, Joseph. So what you have here is um, a ternary map where we use the analytical signal, the horizontal derivative and this is supposed to be the vertical derivative. And you can clearly see that as I've said, that the single granite itself is not very uh, pronounced at the surface. You can't quite see it. But here, you can clearly see the, it, the structure. Most of the geologic studies have characterized the single granite as just being a pluton with a satellite here. But as you look 
at this, you find out that it's actually not, it's revealing a lot more detail in the structure and that this is actually what we are suggesting is that the single granite is actually rings and like a nested ring uh, complex. And so you can also see some dikes that cut right across it. So this is also the radiometric map here showing you again, same, uh, both the radiometrics and the magnetic were acquired at the same time. You can clearly see here the, um, the single granite expressed there. So this is a 3D voxy model of the single granite, and you can clearly see that it has, as I've said, we've, we've identified several rings, and I'll be showing you a map of the rings that we've uh, actually mapped, and it has steeply dipping sites, and we're going to use this to be able to determine what, the, um, what we think is the history of development or emplacement of this particular granite. So here's a 2D uh, forward model just showing that we have the non-magnetic um, central part of the granitic body here and the margins. Uh, that are very magnetic. At first, we thought that perhaps this is just a chilled margin, uh, but later on, we see we 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 came with the conclusion that it, it is in fact um, a, a ring dikes. So here's a schematic um, of how these dike intrusions would actually form, and essentially you have a, a magma chamber here that gets filled up, and then we get a, a collapse or an intrusion of of say dikes here, and so the central part of this um, magma chamber basically collapses, and then you have intrusions along these rings of what we think is the ring, the rim that we find of the single granite that is very magnetic, and then this is later filled in with the central part of the granitic body which was non-magnetic. So here's our ring evolution model here. What we think is we're able to map at least uh, six to eight rings here and therefore suggest that it is in fact a ring complex and um, the numbers represent what we think is a timing. We are not exactly sure one and two which one is older but by looking at cross-cutting relationships we think that this um, we, have, we have a central um, ring complex and what we have here is a radiating magma chamber that essentially we are having a, a shifting magma chamber with these different intrusions forming um, the rings. This is an example of what the nested ring complex looks like, and this is from Niger, and you can clearly see here the different rings. And so uh, ring complexes are very typical and very common. If you look at the basement geology of Africa, you tend to find a lot of them. But the single granite happens to be probably the oldest of these uh, ring complexes that we've been able to map. What I've superimposed here is just a map of the mineral occurrences, and you can clearly see here, so we have tungsten, the W is tungsten, and green is the gold, that this uh, minerals are actually associated with the ring. So in conclusion then, um, hopefully we're able to demonstrate that this aeromagnetic and radiometric images suggest that the ring, the single granite is characterized by both paramagnetic, which is a non-magnetic center, and a, a more ferromagnetic uh, or higher susceptibilities around its rim. And that we, what we see is four to eight nested rings, and the mechanism of emplacement was of course um, uh, uh, a cauldron collapsed and a shifting magma chamber radiating outwards from a central chamber. The magnetic rims result from input of differentiated magma uh, and also input of, of different uh, magma pulses. Tungsten and of course some of the gold mineralization is associated with the rings. So we think that a better map of the rings and with follow-up geologic studies would actually help with mineral exploration in this area. I just want to acknowledge the government of Uganda for providing us with access to the airborne geophysical data. And the data, by the way, is in fact uh, available for free if it's a research institution. You just have to contact the, uh, I guess, the director of the geological survey and you can have access to the data. Thank you. Um, uh, any quick questions? One quick question? Yeah. Yes. Yes, you. <laughs> I just wonder, I'm just curious. Okay, could we, could we go back to a geomagnetic thing? This one? No, no. Far. From the beginning. No, no. Yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 Yeah, I'm just curious. You mentioned that the geoplot is a meridian <coughs> system. Horizon curve and vertical curve. So why is ES and AS? 
Oh, that's the, that's, so the AS is the analytical signal. And then the DX is basically the horizontal derivative of the, of the magnetic field. That's really what it is. It's, a, it's supposed to be a DZ. So one is the horizontal derivative, and then the other one is the vertical derivative. Yes. Okay. 